Well, hello, this is Ronnie Wolf, pastor of First Baptist Church in Harrison, Ohio. Uh, back from vacation, had a great time, and uh, ready to get back to work and get things done. And so I'm bringing another video for you today. Uh, uh, we've had some pretty good attendance at church. Uh, some of the people are still staying home because of the virus. And for other reasons, we have several people who are ill, and we pray for them. We pray for our missionaries, for our own church, and the members, and uh, we hope that you'll pray for us too, if you think of us. Today I'd like to talk about the living Word of God. We find a text in John chapter 1, and verses 1 and 2. I would like for you to get a Bible and open up to that passage, because uh, we're going to take it sort of one or two words or a phrase at a time and look at it because it's a pretty deep verse when you start studying it. And uh, the first two verses of John chapter 1 read like this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Uh, we're going to spend a few minutes here now talking about the Word here in John chapter 1. Uh, there's no way that we can do a complete study of the Word in these uh, few minutes that we're going to have in this video, but we can at least find out a thing or two about this Word that we read about in John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And then even later on we read about it again. So maybe in the next lesson we'll talk further about the Word. In these two verses we want to see the Word's existence, His existence, and it's a He, not a what. Uh, so, at the same time, we'll go ahead and say that the Word is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, uh, which we can all see as we read the book of John. It's very evident that uh, the Word here is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so let's notice a few things about the Word as we break this, uh, these verses down. We read first in the beginning. The beginning refers here to the beginning of creation, that time uh, when time itself was created. The earth was created and everything that's in the earth and the heavens was created. That's the beginning that we're talking about. We'll find out in a moment that Jesus existed before this beginning, but our minds are now on the beginning of creation. And if I don't have time to get into that before the creation, uh, hopefully we'll get into it a little later in another video. We see two references in the New Testament of the beginning of the creation. Uh, you might want to write down the references unless you want to go ahead and try to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4. And it says there, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And so there's one mention of the beginning of the creation. That's the beginning we're talking about in John chapter 1. In the book of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, it says, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And so we have here the, the beginning of the creation. And that's the, the beginning that we're talking about right here. Now let's go on to the word was. In the beginning was. Now we want to stop and see this one word, the one word was. Some give us the idea that this is the actual beginning of Jesus and that God created Jesus at this time. But we don't believe that. We believe that the word was here, the Greek word ain, is in the imperfect, which means that it does not designate the beginning of a thing, but the existing of a thing. This word was carries with it the idea that in the beginning Jesus existed. He already existed. This word 
uh, is a word without a time limit. So it just means that in the beginning of the creation, Jesus was. Not that he started there, not that he began there, not that God created him there, because of course we know he wasn't the created being, but that he was already there. And this is why we have this verse in Hebrews 13, 8, it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. I love that verse. Jesus, the Word, is not limited to time and space, but He's eternal with His Father and with the Holy Spirit. And this word was is used four times in these two verses, and they all are the same Greek word. Now later we're going to see another word in verse 14, which expresses the idea that Jesus comes into the earth. That is, he actually comes into the existence as a human being on the earth. See, now if we read on in this uh, verse, it, it, we talk, the, the phrase, the word, is next. The word, meaning Jesus, was in the beginning. And he's called the word because he is... Uh, the manifestation or the revealing of God to the people of the earth. It's uh, the job of Jesus, the Word, to reveal God to us. Two verses in the Bible tell us this, one being the repeat of the other in, the, in two different Gospels. In Matthew 11, in verse 27, it says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son, but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, or except the Son. And listen to this. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So how do I know the Father? I know the Father only because the Son has revealed him to me. This is repeated with a, a little bit different wording in Luke chapter 10 and verse 22 where it says, All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And so the reason he's called the Word is because he came to reveal the Father unto us. So we can't know the Father, God the Father, unless Jesus the Son reveals him to us. as his job as mediator and as our Savior. The verse goes on and says, and the Word was with God. The Word was with God. Remember, this is the same word, was, as we read before. Jesus is known as the second person of the Trinity. God the Father is the first person. The Son, Jesus, is the second person of the Trinity. And the Spirit is is the third person of the Trinity. Now we could say a whole lot of things about that and go into a study of that, but that's not the reason for this video. So here we see that God the Father existed in the beginning and Jesus was with him. Don't forget that when God created the heavens and the earth, that Jesus was with him at the beginning, at that time. Being with God he was in company with his Father, even in the beginning. Being with God also indicates that the Son, which is the Word, Jesus, was active also in the creation. They created the world together. If you want to turn to Colossians 1, if you have time to do that. Colossians 1, verse 15 through 17, we're going to see this. It says, who is, and talking about Jesus here, it says, who, that's Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. That means he was, be he was before any creation. Verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And so we find here that Jesus is the creator of all things. Not only is he the creator of all things, we found out we find out in Genesis 1 1 
But in the beginning, God created. See? Uh, the heavens and the earth. And so here we find that Jesus created the heavens and the earth and all things. And so Jesus and God created together. And that's one of the ideas of Jesus being with him. There was never a time when Jesus uh, was not uh, without the Father. Or was not, I'm sorry, was not with the Father. Because God was with him all the time. You say, what about when he was on the cross and when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Remember uh, that he said before his death, Into my hands I commit my spirit. And so when he commended his spirit to the Father, he was with the Father after his death on the cross. But even in that time where he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God the Father, we know that God the Father loved his son Jesus and would never have forsaken him in the sense that they were not together. God forsook him in his flesh in the sense that all through his life he gave his son love and he gave him his gracious presence in every situation. But on the cross, God had to turn from his gracious presence to pour out his wrath on his son for us as sinners that we might be saved by grace through faith. So that's the sense in which God turned his back upon his son, not his presence. Actually, his presence was, was fiercely with his son all through the time he was on the cross. First, it was in gracious presence before he went to the cross. But in that darkness on the cross, when a transaction took place between God the Father and God the Son, that is none of our business that he turned the, the world black in darkness to carry on that transgression, uh, that's, uh, that transaction, transaction I'm trying to say. After Jesus' resurrection, he ascended into the heavens to be with his Father and to be glorified in his glorified body in God's presence, his immediate presence, having completed Christ's work of redemption for us. And so God forsook him in the sense that he, not that he wasn't present with him, but that he turned his presence from a gracious presence to a wrathful presence, to where he consumed him with God's wrath upon him, as a, upon Jesus, as our substitute. That should have been for me, but it was actually for, uh, that Christ actually took that wrath upon himself to suffer for my sins on the cross of Calvary. God was with him in a very strong way there when he was pour, pouring out his wrath upon his son. And then we finish out the verses in the last phrase that says, and the word was God. The word was God. That's exciting, isn't it? We see that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. But now we read, and the word was God. That's the same word was that we read before. It hasn't changed. It's the same old word. He was God in the beginning. He was God before the beginning. He was God in the Old Testament. He was God when he was walking the face of the earth. And he will always be God. He did not become God. He already was God. If, if he was God, then he has already uh, been God and always will be God. He's eternally God. Not only so, but he must have have all of the transitive and intransitive attributes of God. Everything that God is, Jesus is. Theologians used to say that Jesus is very God of very God. That means he's truly God of truly God. Everything God the Father is, Jesus is. Everything Jesus is, God is. And the Holy Spirit is. And that means that he is truly God, really God, not just a shadow or a mere image of God, though he was the express image of God when he was here on the earth, but he was also very God or truly God. If we had time, we could go into a study of the divinity of Christ, uh, and perhaps sometime we'll do that, but we don't have time to do that now. And the word was with God. Isn't it interesting that it's already said that, that Jesus was with God, but then it says that he was God. 
But then notice that he repeats this, and the word was with God. And I think this was repeated for at least two reasons. First of all, to emphasize the importance of Jesus being with God in the beginning or accompanying him uh, in the creation, which we all know that that was the truth, and, and to sort of repeat that and to remind us that he was with God in the beginning and was creating things along with God. But then, number two, he is with God to turn our attention to the word himself and his work as it's recorded in the book of the Bible, uh, this book of the Bible, the book of John. In other words, to get our mind uh, focused now not just on the idea that Jesus is God, but that Jesus was with God, meaning that we're now going to focus our attention particularly on the Word. See, so our attention now will be on Jesus, the Word, and not on Jesus and the Father together, but on Jesus uh with being with God or being in a sense separate from God because when we read the book of John we're going to read about him as a man we're going to read about him showing that he is the son of God walking in the flesh and showing us who the father is and John writing about the word Jesus in his book in the book of John he elevates him to show that he is God and Mainly, this book was written for one of the main reasons was to show that Jesus is God. Even though he was walking in the world in his flesh, he still was God. So now, we've met the Father, God. We've met the Son, God. And later in this book, we're going to meet the Spirit, God. And so now let us focus our attention on the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, the Word. And then as we do that, and as we think about Jesus, the Word, let's focus on the book of Acts, chapter 4, and verse 12. Most of you know it by heart. Listen to it carefully, especially if you don't know it by heart. It says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And we know that we're talking about the name Jesus, who is God. It's through faith in the Word, Jesus Christ, that we're saved. I'm going to close with a verse from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14. Very simple verse. Notice what it says. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Paul here was telling the Thessalonians that even though their loved ones had died, it doesn't mean that they're forgotten. It doesn't mean that they're gone forever. But even we who are alive, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, it goes on to tell us in verses 15 and 16 of 1 Thessalonians 4 that Jesus will come again and he will raise up the dead first they will rise first and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord and he says to comfort one another with these words but I want you to I want to emphasize the words in verse 14 if we believe that Jesus died and rose again that's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ you must believe don't do anything else. Just believe that Jesus died and rose again. And that he died for you. and Paid your sin debt for you. And just by believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, you can be saved and have everlasting life. And be taken to heaven, either when you die or when Jesus comes again and takes his people out of the world and resurrects the, 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 those who sleep in Jesus, those who are dead in Jesus, those who've died before us, and yet they're in Jesus, and he will bring them uh, with him. And we're so thankful for that. We pray today that you're saved by the grace of God. If not, repent and turn from your sins and believe and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Appreciate your listening. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful message from the Word of God. Bless those who believe 
that we'll have stronger faith in you and serve you and be faithful to you. Those who have not yet believed, Lord, send the Holy Spirit to do his work in their hearts that they might come to you. Believe that Jesus uh, uh, was uh, on the cross and that, uh, that Jesus died and that he arose again by his own power, by the power of God. And because of that, we can have eternal life by faith in Christ, by the grace of God. In Jesus' name, amen.